Uh, anyway, thank you, for, thank you for joining the session. My name is Craig Rodney. I, um, I used to uh, run an a marketing agency in South Africa called Cerebra. Uh, we did a lot of social media stuff for Coke, for Vodacom, Huawei, Ford, Absa, quite a few guys. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my background. Um, but the, my credentials for doing this talk, though, I run the at South Africa Instagram account. I've done it for almost seven years. Um, and it's been a, a privilege to run such a big account, and, um, and, and I've been able to learn a lot. So what I want to talk to you guys about today are the eight principles of success on Instagram. What you'll realize that the vast majority of these apply to any form of storytelling. So any of your comms going out into the world across any chat channel or any platform, um, this will be relevant for. I just like to make it specific to Instagram because that's where my learnings are. Um, uh, so, so we can jump right in. That this is me, Craig Rodney, Yoko Exchange, finding success on Instagram. So I want to start from an Instagram perspective. Instagram's been around since 2010, so it's 10 years. And the one thing that's never changed, which is your North Star, is that Instagram, first and foremost, is an inspiration platform. Right? There's a lot of companies and a lot of brands make the mistake of, of, of thinking that Instagram is this kind of direct sales platform some of the times. Um, and, but, but first and foremost, it's an inspiration platform. It's generally what, why people get a lot of value out of Instagram is, is they want to be inspired by the accounts that they follow. They want to learn, they want to explore, they want to experience new things. But people open Instagram for the most part to, to feel better. Um, and and, and uh, as a whole, if that's our North Star, we want to recognize that whatever we're doing, whatever we're creating on Instagram or whatever stories we're taking out there, inspiration is one of the strongest, purest kind of uh, behavioral drivers that we, want to, that we want to create. So that starts with our North Star. Before I jump into the eight, um, the eight uh, uh, success factors for Instagram, I want to start with a cool story. And it happened in, in a small town called Borja in Spain. Um, there was, uh, there was a church in Borja, they had this, um, they had a painting of, uh, of Christ up on the, one of the walls. Uh, this is an early picture on the left, that's an early picture. Um, a little bit later on, the, the painting had uh, degraded quite a bit in this church. But what you need to know about Borja in Spain is that no one ever went there. It wasn't a tourist destination, it was just some random small town and they had a church and they were not even, hardly on the map at all, right? But then something amazing happened. One of the old ladies who lived in the village in Bordia and who went to the church all the time was incredibly heartbroken by the deterioration of this picture. She took it quite personally and she decided, she took it upon herself to, uh, to restore this amazing image of Christ, right? And if you guys have seen the Mr. Bean movie, this is straight out of Mr. Bean. So she took her home paint set, she walked into the church and she did this. Um, it's the, the likeness is incredible. I mean, right? You can't go wrong. But what happened is, is that, is that f from an artistic perspective, she destroyed the painting, right? Except that it made the news and it made the local news in Spain and then people were like, this is incredible. And then it made kind of national Spanish news and then it jumped onto international news and it was across Sky and it was on CNN and all this kind of stuff because it's a phenomenal story. I mean, some old lady, completely, completely, I mean, in their words, destroying a piece of art. Um, but then an interesting thing happened, right? Tourism to the town of Borja skyrocketed, right? People were flying in from all over the world to see this painting. No one went to go see the first painting, but everyone went to go see the last painting because it's way better. It's a much better story. It worked out well for the church. What the church did is they actually had to charge, ended up charging a cover charge for all the tourists going. They charged them a cover charge to get into the church, to take photos and all that kind of stuff. So it became a nice revenue generating thing. And then they used that revenue to do correct restorations on a lot of the, of the remaining pictures, etc. But what it proves um, and for me, which is one of, the, one of the great lessons around storytelling, is that the quality of the image has, is nowhere near as important as the quality of the story, right? And we've got to be careful with this. When we go into these Instagram, especially Instagram, we get fooled because there are some incredible images out there, right? And we follow these top travel photographers who, who have everything done for them to create the world's greatest image, and then we think we need to compete. And one, and, and, and those guys build their following around that way. It's not to say that people don't like great imagery, but story trumps image all the time. All right. Um, so to prove it, we're going to do this exercise, right? This is a good photo. 
right? No one's going to disagree with that. If any one of us took this photo, we would post it, right? Like, I would, that would be straight on Instagram. I'd probably do a portrait, not landscape, but it would go on Instagram, and I'd be like, oh, having the best fishing trip or whatever, and people would be like, oh my God, you live the best life. This is amazing. Like, what, what, in a, 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 but it's a, it's a good photo. But it's not a great photo. It's just a good photo, right? This is a great photo. This is a photo by the photographer Penny Smith, right? Um, it ended up being the cover of uh, the Clash album called London Calling. It was voted the rock and roll photo of all time, right? And when you consider the, the scale of rock and roll photos, this was voted the number one rock and roll photo of all time. It is a great photo. It's a bad photo, though. Right? It isn't a good photo. Penny Smith, the photographer, refused to let the band use it because she said it's going to make her the laughing stock of musical photographers around the world. And she went into a fight with them. Right? The reason why she didn't want them using the photo is because she was feeling sick that night. She'd been on tour with the band, so she, she had shot a lot of their concerts, but this night she was feeling sick. So instead of being in the pit at the front of the stage with all the other photographers, she was sitting at the back of the stage. So firstly, this isn't from the front of the stage. So this is the back of the stage. She's sitting where the sound engineers are, right? she taken one photo on that roll of film that night, and this was it, because she had loaded everything, and she was setting the camera between her, between her legs, but she wasn't shooting because she was feeling ill. She saw the uh, bass guitarist getting irritated, and he started kicking things around. He started getting grumpy, so she lifted the camera, and he swung... Um, swung the guitar and she took one picture and it became the rock and roll photo of all time. It is blurry, so it's out of focus, it's from the wrong part of the stage that you should be shooting from and it, was, it became a great iconic photo, right? But it's not a good photo, but it is a great photo because of the scenario, because of what it came to represent for rock and roll. So it's a great photo. It's not an incredible photo though, right? This is an incredible photo. This is a photo from Tiananmen Square, um, the, the, the man who decided he'd had enough and walked with his shopping bags into the middle of Tiananmen Square, stood in front of the uh, approaching tanks and halted the entire procession of tanks. One man on his own had enough. Someone took a photo of it. There's actually a couple of photos, but this is, someone took this photo of it. The man was taken away by police, never seen again. No one knows who he is, or he's become known as Tank Man, right? Um, the reason it's an incredible photo is because there's 1.2 billion people on this planet who are prevented from seeing this photo, right? If you live inside mainland China and you Google Tiananmen Square, you will not be allowed to see this photo. It is stripped out of every single search result on every single uh, internet-connected device within China because of what it represents, because it represents resistance, standing up against the government, standing up against the military, fighting for your rights, and China aren't that keen on on, have, on this, this content being available to their citizens. So it is completely banned, right? It's not a great photo from a photographer, from a content point of view, but it is an absolutely incredible photo. So again, I want you guys to recognize that the story and the meaning behind your images is far more important than the quality of the image. Don't get into the trap of constantly trying to post good photos. Try and create incredible stories, all right? Okay, so that was just my intro. We're going to get stuck into it now. These are the eight core principles. You don't need to read that. I didn't realize it, was, it would be that illegible in here. Um, but we get, so we're going to go through the eight anyway. Um, before I jump into this, these eight principles are, are guidelines around understanding the content. If you guys want to have a more practical session, I am doing an Instagram workshop. These are kind of that higher level theoretical stuff. Um, but I want, you, I want you to know that having done this for a very, very long time, these are absolute truths, okay? So please understand um, that, that I'm not giving you a, a a tips and tricks on, on what time of day to post. This is around uh, understanding of storytelling, um, specifically on Instagram. So the first principle to understand is the buyer-seller disconnect. Um, and almost every single business on the planet gets this wrong, all right? On the left is a photo of a drill, and on the right is a photo of pictures on the wall, right? People who sell drills market drills, right? They put these broad sheets, and they go, like, at, you know, Builder's Warehouse. These are all the drills and stuff like that. Um, and barring my brother, who is an absolute tool nerd, I never met anyone else who wants to own a drill, right? Like, I don't know many people who are like, ooh, look at that drill, I need to upgrade. 
my old drill's getting a bit old now, right? It doesn't quite drill perfectly. And you, like, people don't behave like that, right? What people selling drills think we want is drills. What we actually want are to hang pictures. We want holes in the wall. If there was a better way of putting a hole in a wall or hanging a picture, I don't need a drill, right? As marketers or as salespeople, which is essentially what we're doing, we need to look very, we'll have a very stern look at what we sell and recognize, do people actually need this or do they want what this does for them, all right? And what you'll probably realize is that the content that I, want to, that I want to consume from a company that sells tools is what I can do with those, what I can create, what will exist tomorrow in my life that didn't exist yesterday if I happen to own these tools. But I sure as hell don't want a drill. I don't need a drill in my life. What I need is to hang pictures. All right, so this buyer-seller disconnect, and it is pervasive, it exists everywhere. In the tourism space, is the worst. Hotels constantly posting photos to their social feeds of good-looking buffets, right? Like, if, like, that is the most common thing on the planet. It is so basic, it's such a basic level of expe expectation that I no longer have it as an expectation. It's fallen off the bottom, right? We don't travel the world to go to hotels and eat buffets and meet smiling receptionists. We travel the world to have experiences to meet new people, to see new things, right? I don't need to know about your buffet to decide if I want to go to that city or not. If you inspire me to go to a city and you are the conduit for that inspiration, there's a very good chance I will stay at your hotel. This buyer-seller disconnect is pervasive, so watch out for it in your products and in your services because you're going to get stuck only selling to people who desperately want to buy drills and there is something desperately wrong with people who want to buy drills. Okay. The second principle is called the sacrifice principle. Um, marketers, for the most part, become quite comfortable with this when they understand it. CEOs hate it. So if you're a marketing person and you have to explain your actions to a CEO, to someone who doesn't understand marketing, like this is going to be a minefield, so be prepared. Uh, the, principle, the, uh, the understanding around the sacrifice principle is that what's big in your world is not necessarily big in the world, right? And, and it, there's, a, there's a level of humility that you have to accept that when you have this incredible piece of news that you want to share with the world and you're overly excited about it, don't be disappointed when no one cares, right? Because it's big in your world, but it really isn't big in their world, right? Um, so there's a couple of quite nerdy economic graphs that I want to take you through to try and explain this, right? When you look at the, comp the, the, re the relationship between audience size and brand message, Right? We have an inverse correlation. So the more people you want to reach and the relevance to your message go in opposite directions. So to explain it this way, if you write a product press release for within your business, it has massively high relevance and incredibly low reach. Right? And with a background in PR, I can tell you that it was almost impossible to get everyone who works at a company to care about that company's press release. Right? You have big companies that have like 3,000 employees, and then they'll publish a press release that has like 28 views. And you're like, your employees don't even care. <laughs> like, if you can't even get your employees to care about this and you pay them, how are you going to get anyone else to care? Right? So there's this massive disconnect. Now, what we know about the internet is that cat pictures really work. Right? Cat pictures have massive reach and boobs. I didn't put that on the slide. But generally, the rule with the internet is boobs and cat pictures, you've got guaranteed reach, but very, very low relevance, right? You can reach millions of people with content. It is actually incredibly easy to create content that reaches millions of people. It's really, really difficult to make it relevant to a brand, to get everyone who receives that piece of content to go like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize there was this brand associated, right? So there's a relationship between these two. And the sacrifice principle goes that if you, want to if you want to reach a larger audience, you have to sacrifice brand message. You have to make it less and less about you and more and more about the person who you want to reach. Right? And that's terrifying because CEOs are like, if our company name isn't mentioned every third word in our piece of communication, I'm not going to approve it. Right? And then it fails. And then they put your line on the job, your job on the line, and they go, why didn't we get a million people to watch our video? And you're like, because they made it about us, and no one cares about us. It needs to be about them. People aren't here caring about us. All right. So it looks like this. Anything before the inflection point serves commercial intent. What you're doing is you're prioritizing 
a, a relatively selfish commercial intent over the desires of the audience. After the inflection point, you're, conserving cons you're serving consumer interest, right? You're making it about reaching numbers as opposed to about your business. Now, I would far rather be on the right-hand side of this uh, uh, inflection point than on the left. And the reason being is that there are some incredibly cool technological tools that we can use to close the gap. I would rather have 10 million people have consumed a piece of content and have a low percentage of that people know that I was the brand behind it. Because once they've consumed that content and they become interested in, interested in it, I can potentially serialize it. I can do another piece of content and they will consume that because they saw the first one. They're like, oh, hey, there's another video from that same guy, right? And slowly but surely they close that gap. I can flood Google AdWords for people searching for XYZ video and then my ads can come up and people will slowly but surely recognize that we are the brand behind it, all right? But I would take my chances, I would favor the odds of still, I would rather reach 2 million people and have a 10% conversion rate than reach 200 people, right, with a 100% conversion rate. Like the, the, numbers, the numbers are never in favor of restricting reach. So please understand when you're creating content, know that you need to serve the audience. It is important to try and create content that will create reach and understand how do we bleed our brand message in behind that? How do we close that gap afterwards? The third is probably my favorite one, um, and it's simplicity wins. When you go onto platforms like Instagram, you've got to realize that you're getting milliseconds of time. You know, when people scroll, they go like, scroll like, scroll like, scroll like, scroll like, scroll like, flush the toilet, scroll like, scroll like, right? Like, that's generally the way that it works. When you create content, I've always said that I want, when I post content, I want to post imagery that makes people scroll up on Instagram. Because people will scroll past it, but I want them to scroll past it and go, whoa, 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 what was that? And then they scroll back up, and they're like, oh, that's amazing. And then they read the caption, and then they're engaged. And if you can get that right, then, then you're doing really well. But a lot of the time, we favor complexity over simplicity. The reason there's a photo of Jim Carrey representing the slide is that on Facebook, there is a Facebook page called the same photo of Jim Carrey every day. <laughs> right? And you'll never guess what this page does it posts the exact same photo of Jim Carrey every single day for about six years now, <laughs> okay? Every single day. Now, the beautiful thing is that they state what they do. They, they declare their promise. We will post the same photo of Jim Carrey every single day, right? So it's a really simple transaction. Like, if you want to receive the same photo of Jim Carrey every single day, just follow that page, and it'll appear in your feed every single day, right? 260,000 Facebook fans, roughly around 30,000 engagements per post <laughs> on the exact same photo of Jim Carrey every single day. Now, why do people want the same photo of Jim Carrey every single day? And I can answer that, because we have things like coronavirus <laughs> that consume our lives with worry and anxiety, and every now and again, I want a break. And if I get to have a little giggle by going, <laughs> Jim Carrey's cool, right? And if that's it, I'm in. The simplest idea will attract a quarter of a million people who will consume this and absolutely love it. Now, sure, I get that it's not about your brand, right? But as an example, it absolutely stands out. And there's a couple of reasons why, and I want to go into this, it's important, why we aren't brave enough to, to tackle simple ideas. So, and I just want to give another thing. As I said at the beginning, I run the South Africa Instagram account. It's got a cool username, but I take a very simple approach to it. I post one photo every single day and I have done so for almost seven years. So that's well over 2,000 days in a row. I've never missed a day of posting a photo of South Africa onto the account. And it is now one of the biggest tourism accounts in the country. But the promise is simple. Do you want to receive a photo of South Africa every single day? Yep, well then, 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 then you're at the right place. If you want other stuff, find other Instagrammers. That's not what you're gonna get here, all right? But it's a very simple promise and people love that simplicity and people love knowing What's going to come? I've got two very young kids, and I go, what do you guys, what book do you want to read tonight? And they go, oh, and they always say the same one as the night before. And you're like, oh, this is going to end me. Like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And what you realize is that, is that the reason why kids want the same book over and over again is because they know what's going to happen. And it creates a level of comfort for them, right? Because when they're reading a story and they don't know how it ends, it creates anxiety, and they get stressed. And it could be a cool story, but they're like, oh, what's going to happen? And they ask lots of questions, all right? 
And when they know what's coming, they feel confident, they feel safe, and they feel secure. And we are still all children, and we behave in exact same ways. And that's why people like that. Okay, so the first reason why we don't, this is don't, don't aggressively go after simplicity is because of imposter syndrome. For more often than not, we're going to have to present an Instagram strategy to someone who probably doesn't have an Instagram account. They're probably still using a BlackBerry, right? And we know that there's no ways that we're going to be able to sound like we know what we're talking about when we tell our CEO we're going to post the same photo of Jim Carrey every single day and it's going to work. So we get so afraid that these guys are going to look at us like we don't know what we're talking about because our idea for an execution is so simple that we try and make it complicated. The more complicated, the easier it is to sell to a CEO because they're just going to go, they're going to take a gut feel and go, the more complicated idea is better than the simpler idea. And so we, so we get nervous about it, right? So please understand that, that you, you're going to have to have this fight. You're going to have to go with your ammunition and go, this is why simple ideas win, right? And if you feel like you're losing it, just tell them how much cheaper it is to repeat simple ideas and then you'll win. Okay, so that's the first reason why we don't do simple. The second reason is we, we often um, misunderstand the relationship between action and consequence. Right, and this, this for me is one of the biggest things to try and figure out. Right? Action and consequence are two separate things. Right? When I look at the South Africa Instagram account, the consequences of having done this for seven years and having almost 300,000 followers is that people use the account for inspiration, they use it to build itineraries, they use it to tag their friends in upcoming trips, they use it to find places where they want to go. Like, there's so many cool things that they use this account for. The consequences of the photos going up on this account are quite diverse. The action is really simple. Post one photo every single day. What, a lot, what happens a lot of the time when we do our marketing planning is we define all the consequences that we want to see affected in the world. And then we start trying to decide what we need to do to affect all of these consequences. And it creates massive complexity. And we often don't realize that simple actions can create incredibly diverse consequences. Right? The fitness and weight loss industry is, is one of the best examples of looking at this, right? And it's not to kind of diminish the sciences that go into this. But if anyone here has ever sat down and gone, oh, maybe I should, should lose some weight, right? You can't lose weight by wanting to lose weight. You can't lose weight by think of pity. You can't lose weight by thinking about it, right? Weight loss is a consequence. If you want to lose weight, you have to accept that it is a consequence of something else. And our planning for weight loss generally is in the action space, right? And it's four words for the most part. Uh, it's, it's run more, eat less. Those four words as actions will probably have a significant consequence of weight loss. The consequence will also you'll probably be happier, you'll be fitter, you'll be healthier, you'll be more productive at work. Like there's all these other consequences from these actions. Right? But never ever start, never ever develop a plan backwards from consequences because it always gets incredibly, incredibly complicated. Try and start with the simplest action you can and try and understand what are the, what are the myriad consequences that could come from this. And then the third reason why we avoid, um, why we avoid, com why we avoid doing simple things is because we have this thing called audience FOMO. Right? So again, when you go into a business, and often it happens with me, and I'll go into a, a company, I'll go, okay, cool, who are you trying to sell to? And they go, everyone. And you're like, no, 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 like, honestly, like, like who are your customers? Everyone. And you're like, yeah, but I, I need to create communication that people care about. Like, I can't create communication for everyone. And you're like, okay, okay we can't work together, thank you very much. And you leave. That businesses are so afraid of missing out on audiences and potential sales audiences that they group everyone together and they create bland content that serves everyone. And I do talk about this as one of the principles just now, so I won't go into it, right? But we have this fear of missing out on audiences. No matter how small they are, we go, we want them as well and we want them as well. And again, when you create a simple piece of content that serves one audience, the consequences that other audiences often get tagged in and they often become interested at the same time, right? So please, guys, Simplicity and avoid, avoid those three things. The fourth principle is to be something. And, and this is generally, if you ever booked me to come in and help you guys with your Instagram account, this is the first and hardest question I'm gonna ask you. 
right? And it's gonna be this, right? Oh, sorry, just as an example, right? The B something means that you've got like Lorraine Lewitz, sorry guys, I'm in the way, but you've got Lorraine Lewitz um, who started a 365 project which was do a thing every day for a year and she did miniature paintings and she was like every day for 365 days I'm gonna paint a miniature painting and you'll see over a year how, how the her progression how much better she got right but that was her Instagram account before that it was pets and everything else right but she became known as the miniature painting lady right she's now a, a, a properly she's had exhibitions in New York London like her miniature paintings which are the size of two rand coin coins sell for like 20 30 thousand rand um, she became something because she stated, this is what I am. I'm the miniature paintings person, right? Um, Ross Simmons, who's white on rice, he's the origami guy, right? And then you get, I see a different you, and they became the Soweto fashion guys. And that was their promise, right? They created a, quite a defined promise. This is what we are. This is what you get here. And it makes it a binary decision. You're either in or you're out, right? But I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna go, this is what our promise is. So my challenge to you guys is this. What are you? I'm the what account, right? Because for the most part, I can tell you already, you're the a little bit of everything account, right? And people don't really want to follow a little bit of everything accounts, okay? Because that's not what Instagram is about. So. Again, there's sacrifice that's got to go into it. There's simplicity that's got to go into it. There's a lot that's got to go into this, right? But I believe it's critical that you are able to articulate your promise and say, we're the this account. If you follow us, this is what you get. And give people the option to make that decision as to whether they're in or out. The fifth principle for success is to pick one audience. So um, these two guys are Hamish and Andy. They are Australian radio hosts. They've got a, a radio, daily radio show in Australia. It's the most listened to radio show. They um, then convert that radio show into a podcast and it's one of the biggest podcasts on the planet. Um, I listened to their podcast religiously every single day for a few years, fell in love with them. I became obsessed, like I was, I was properly enmeshed in, in their world, like they, they, they had me. Um, Hamish is the guy on the left, Andy's the guy on the right. Um, by my reckoning, Hamish is the slightly funnier guy. Like he's a little bit quirky, so I, I kind of, um, I see a bit of myself in him. Um, and, and, and then Andy tends to be the laugher, right? And, and uh, interestingly, I was listening to an interview, uh, a different radio station was interviewing Hamish the one day about the success of his show. Um, and that radio host said to ask Hamish a question. They said, Hamish, how do you make the whole of Australia laugh every single day? That's a legitimate question, because he comes pretty close. And they're like, how do you make the whole of Australia laugh every single day? And his response was profound. He said, oh, don't even worry about that. He goes, I just try and make Andy laugh, right? And you realize that Andy had been his best friend his whole life. They started this garage radio show that grew and grew and grew. But his audience was one. He had an absolute audience of one person, and his if, imagine someone said to you, you need to write and script a radio show that makes the whole of Australia laugh. Like, you're gonna have a panic attack and you're gonna shut down, right? But if someone says, I want you to write a radio show that makes your best friend laugh, easy, right? So suddenly we go, cool. Now what I'm saying to you is, when you create content, pick an audience of one. Pick one person who is in that audience. And when I say one, not a homogenized version, pick an actual person who you know represents that group of people you're trying to speak to and create communication and create content for that one person. But you only ever write for one person. You create video content and you photograph and you create whatever you want to create for one person because it's so easy to create content that you know that one person will love. And then when you put it out there, you realize that there are millions of people just like that person. They're quite an exclusive safari lodge. And they were stuck in this trap of posting the same kind of photos online and going like, well, we're not really getting anywhere. And I said, photos of leopards and your buffet will probably be okay for your existing followers, but if you wanna, if you wanna target specifically around sales, you need to look at who are the kinds of people that go on safaris, right? And you go, cool, well, if we look at the niche, I know for a fact that a safari is a bucket list people for people when they retire. And we can target people when they retire. We know that they fit a certain age group, certain demographic, and we can target them through specific mediums, right? So how about you create an entire 
entire series of content specifically for old age travelers, right? And that means that, that when you post photos of Land Rovers, you show steps going up into the Land Rover. And it's photos of the blankets and the coffees. And it's photos of, of fridges in rooms to keep medication cold. And everything, and you go, basically, you don't make it up. You go and speak to old people, and you go, what are your fears? What are your concerns around going on a safari? And they will give you that list, and you create content to appease those. And then you create a guide to safaris for old people, and you make it downloadable that people have to put their email address in. And when they download it, they give you your email address. You can start selling to them. You can start marketing to them. Right? That kind of content may not work on your existing, for your existing audience, but it sure as hell will, will work for that specific signaled identified group of people. Right? So just because you are, can potentially sell to a broad range of people doesn't mean you sell in a broad way. You sell in a signal sniper approach. You pick very specific target groups of people that you want to talk to, and you create highly signalized content that is irresistible to them. And that's how you attract audiences. Once they're part of the audience, they become part of the homogenized group, and that's OK. But please understand that the content that you create to attract audiences is vastly different to the content that you create to retain an audience. And the best way to identify it is to call them signal versus noise. All right? We do not respond to noise. We tend to tune it out. But if there's that specific frequency that appeals to me specifically, that's what I'll hear, and I'll react and respond to that. And then the final one is the customer's story, and it's been it's, it's lost and it's often the most neglected thing on the planet. So I had this conversation with a guy who runs this big festival, like a music festival the other day, and he was stressing out and he was doing budgets for how many photographers he was going to hire and how they were going to create all this content for their social platforms. And I was like, okay, that's amazing. I love that you're spending money and thinking about what content to create for your Facebook and your Instagram and your Twitter and your TikTok and all this other stuff, right? But what's the collective audience size of your owned platforms? Of all the platforms that you control, how many people? And he was like, oh, 30,000 followers across. You know, if we do deduplicate some of the people who follow us on multiple platforms, we've got 25,000 people. So I'm like, cool. So you're spending all this money to create amazing content that'll reach 25,000 people. Except that you have, probably have 25,000 people attending your festival, and with an average of 100 followers, <laughs> per person conservatively, you've got two and a half million potential audience members within your customer's social network. So surely you should be spending the money helping them create better content, because that's where the audience is. You're neglecting a potential two and a half million people, and you're putting no budget. But I can tell you now that your audience members' really bad photo from your concert will reach more people than your highly curated photo with a professional photographer. So you have to think about your customer's story. You have to think about the content that your customers are creating. I had this interesting discussion with Club Med, because they were doing the same, putting tons of money into creating content for Club Med's platforms, and I was like, you know how many of your servers get asked to take photos of guests? Like every server, Every person who works at Club Med at some point in their life has been, hey, can you take this photo of our family? And this guy's like, <laughs> like shaking, and one of the kids apparently wasn't on holiday because they cut that oak's head off. And, like, and then the person's like, thanks. And then they post that to Facebook. Now, if I'm following you on Facebook, I'm not going to Club Med. That's the worst picture of Club Med I've ever seen in my life, right? So your customer's audience is always going to be significantly by like multiple factors bigger than your own audience. And you cannot neglect them. And there are so many cool ways that you can help your audience tell better stories and create better content across their social platforms. And it's within your control. But I personally would much rather worry about how to, how to improve the quality of content that goes out to two and a half million people than 30,000 people that I currently have in my network. Right? So please don't neglect that. Okay, so guys, those are the, those are the overarching principles around that I fundamentally believe are the keys to creating successful content. I focus on Instagram, but creating successful content across all your social platforms. Um, if you guys want to get into some of the nitty gritty, I'm doing a workshop this afternoon. It's on the schedule, you can have a look. Um, and the structure of the workshop is basically going to be come with your questions, um, because I can't answer everything 
by guessing what you guys want to hear. I'm going to answer it by hearing what you want to hear. Okay. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day.